Hey guys, what's coming up in the upcoming video is yet another Q&A webinar with the Norwegian strength coach Birge Fagerli, where we will be answering 12 of your really cool training related questions. And if you're interested in the topic of muscle hypertrophy and optimizing your training practices, I guarantee that you will be enjoying this episode. Before we get into this episode though, I just quickly want to tell you that some really exciting stuff are happening in sustainable self-development land as of recent times and as of lately, the sustainable self-development group has been brought to life more than ever. We have over a thousand awesome members and have daily discussions over some of the most interesting nutrition and training concepts. Also, the Norwegian mastermind himself, Berge Fagerli, has gotten on board not long ago and he's spreading his knowledge there too. And as of late, we've been doing these really awesome Q&A sessions with Berge in the group where we answer some of the best nutrition and training questions that have come in the group. So if you have not done so already, then be sure to go to facebook.com slash sustainable self-development and join the group. Also, you might want to know that Berge and I are currently working on a really epic training template, which will allow you to get, in our estimation, the best possible training stimulus without having to spend endless hours in the gym and pounding yourself with a bajillion sets every week and burning yourself out. And if this is something that sounds interesting to you, then head over to sustainableselfdevelopment.com and you can claim a 20% discount on this upcoming training template. All right, that's enough of the shameless plugging for now. And with that, let's get into the episode. So this is going to be the second training. So this is going to be the second training Q&A with Berge. The first one turned out uh, really well. So hopefully we can shed some or drop some good knowledge bombs with uh, the help of Berge on your training questions. And which I did my best to select through the best ones that came in over the past few days when I announced that there will be a new Q&A. So we will just go through these. I have 11 questions listed here, but if some good ones will come in in the meanwhile, then um, we will try and answer those as well. So um, are you ready? I think I'll also just mention that um, I wasn't intentionally being vague the last time. It's, it's simply that there's, there's always going to be a set of principles uh, and, and ways to optimize those. And, and uh, it, it's very hard to, to provide some very specific and exact numbers until you actually see the finished program because it takes on qualifications and, uh, and, and specific guidelines for how to optimize it uh, individually. So, so for those who want to see a, a template, it's, it's very hard for me to do that at this point simply because I don't like uh, just just because if I give out the template now, people are going to start to copy that. So. I, I want to make certain that the whole framework is in place before you actually start applying it. Yeah, and, and uh, perhaps also, it's also good to mention that uh, people who were asking for a sample routine, you did provide a sample routine or some sample routines in your uh, MyRep ebook, which uh, which is available for purchase. So, um, which which are kind of in line with the training template we which uh, we will be putting out in the future. So. Uh, that can give you a nice teaser as well. Uh, by the way, if guys, uh, you, if you're watching this, could you do me one? And um, if it popped up in the Facebook group that we are live, just share the live video uh, once again in the Facebook group so people can actually see it because I'm not able to share this at the moment. I don't know. what I just don't see which link I should be sharing. So if someone can do that for me, it would be highly appreciated. Uh, okay, so um, shall we head on with the questions? Cool. Okay. So first question is uh, how often should one switch out movements versus keeping them constant? So I, I guess this is a question which is a, a topic of, of debate in general amongst uh, practitioners, whether we should be sticking to the same core movements in a training program, or is there an inherent benefit to switching them out every once in a while, at least? Well, I think, um, I, I think you, sh you should, in general, try to maintain or keep the same movement simply because that allows you to see whether you're actually progressing. And um, a muscle isn't like a very complex, complex uh, biological thing. It's, it's just like a piece of meat that's contracting against the load. So the actual need for, for variation is more a psychological one than an actual physiological one. But I tend to recommend that if, if an exercise creates any type of uh, discomfort, or aches or pains at worst, then it should definitely be switched out. But um, other than that, I, I, I don't like prescribe to the notion that you should keep 
uh, changing up things in order to uh, maintain progress. Quite the contrary, I think it creates a false sense of progress uh, due to uh, having to relearn uh, movements. So uh, at least when it comes to the core, like compound, big compound movements, if these are movements you can do uh, pain-free and you're able to consistently gain on them, then you should you know, keep those in the routine and then you can switch out some isolation exercises here and there if, uh, if you have an inherent need for variation or, or if, if something, if, if there's a muscle group you want to pay specific attention to or, or something. You know, I, I do think that some muscle groups um, may respond better to uh, to add the isolation movement simply because it creates you know this muscle mind muscle connection at least at, in um, in the higher up phases where you're actually to intention you're able to intentionally focus on uh, certain muscle groups then adding in isolation movements to uh, make you more aware like the proprioception as it's called it, it uh, increases the proprioception and allows you to to uh, perhaps get some more stimulation on those muscle groups uh, within compound movements as well. But as soon as you get into heavy loading, it's, it's not gonna matter. You know, there's studies showing whether you focus on your triceps or chest during a bench press, when a weight is like five to eight reps max, then uh, it doesn't matter. There's no difference in muscle activation. And, and, and perhaps that, that's, uh, that's also a good point to bring up. This was another question that I saw somewhere, but we didn't select it, but maybe we can give that a, a short mention. How do you like to think about counting volume from, for example, pressing exercises? Do you count those as fully effective sets for the triceps or some people only like to count them as half volume? How do you like to think about that? I, I tend to uh, count full volume uh, as long as it's, uh, of course, by varying grip width, you can you can emphasize the triceps uh, uh, to a smaller degree either way. But, uh, I, you know, th this is usually the problem when people add tons of isolation work to their arms and, and wonder why, they, why they're not growing. It's, it's because you're already adding in um, volume to, to, to an optimal volume usually. So... Um, you know, you, you can count it anywhere from half to uh, to full volume. So like a wide grip bench press, you might count the triceps at half volume. But, um, you know, I, I tend to prefer like a moderate, like a medium grip and, and just hit it all. And, and same thing for like push-ups or dips. That type of grip width tends to activate like uh, anterior shoulder, tricep and, and chest equally. And doing a set of chin-ups with your uh, hands facing or even a neutral grip, you're going to activate the biceps uh, quite heavily. So I, I, you need to take that into account. Um, and it quickly becomes overly complicated if you want to start you know, qualifying exercises according to what degree it, it, uh, it hits each individual muscle group. And it's, it's just within th these parameters that, that we're recommending, it's, it's not going to make a, a major difference anyway. Yeah. Uh, a few months ago, I did a video or a podcast episode on why I think that the overhead press sucks for the side delts. Would you say I'm wrong about that? No, not at all. It's, uh, I wouldn't say it sucks, but it's, um, I definitely think some type of movement where you have the, the load vector working against the elbow more directly. So I prefer like doing face pulls uh, mm -hmm. that will hit uh, the side delts uh, better than an overhead press will. Uh, some might disagree, but uh, generally looking at muscle activation patterns, it's it's not very it's not very uh, it's not very large in, in the lateral deltoids. So um, yeah, I was just going to ask you the next question, I believe, which was um, what would you say are the benefits of full body versus upper lower splits? Do you think it's just a matter of convenience and how you allocate things, or uh, is one more beneficial over the other? Um, I, I think it's uh, more beneficial from an efficiency standpoint, simply that, you know, you're, you're focusing your actual training to certain days and then you have more days of uh, total rest in between those full body workouts within a program that optimizes volume and, uh, and frequency per muscle group. So um, I find it easier to control uh, the stress that you impose on the system. And I also find it easier to recover from, even though it's more work. Um, for those days, you also have uh, more rest in between days. 
Uh, I will use uh, like upper lower splits whenever I move into he heavier phases of, uh, of training and, and I want to have higher volume on, on some muscle groups uh, simply because the, the workouts tend to drag on for a while and, and like the exercises you do first in a workout will get the most benefits whereas the exercises last in a workout will get the least so by splitting up you get more high quality work for you know more muscle groups at a time and uh, you know that there's pros and cons with both i tend to prefer full body workouts most of the time but but uh, there will be certain periods of time where i, I also use upper lower splits and, and would you and would you say that um there's an inherent benefit to having complete rest days even if we are talking about the same total weekly volume on all exercises and muscle groups so for example you could have a, a full body training uh, or a full body session which would consist of i don't know a squat an overhead press a chin up and a, a bench press or something and then you could split all of those exercises out or spread those out more evenly across the week on multiple days would you say that um, the overall I guess a recovery that you would get would be the same regardless of how you sp uh, spread it out or there's an, an, inherent, an inherent benefit to having days when you're actually not doing anything? Uh, yes, I tend to think that, um, you know, having to go to the gym every day, every time you, uh, you work out, it creates some systemic, uh, both inflammation and systemic uh, recovery needs. So I, I do tend to think that you're, you're kind of doing yourself a disservice by, uh, you know, spreading things out in a way that you're going to the gym every single day. And, and also from a sustainability standpoint, I know, I know people, some people just love to train and make it part of their daily routine. And I've been there, done that. But in, in my opinion and experience, I, I uh, as I mentioned, I do prefer some full body routines and just go to the gym and do my business. And then know that I have at least one or two days off before I hit the gym again. So it, it I guess it, it does depend on the personality and, and whether you're able to recover between workouts. So if you're in doubt, try experiment with both and see what happens. I have a little baby who's making a, a fuss as we speak. So uh, some days will I know will be compromised recovery wise. And, and so having full body splits and fewer workouts or workout days. Um, makes me able to maybe plan my recovery ahead and, and plan you know my schedule or, or traveling around that much more than okay tomorrow is a workout and the next day is a workout and you know life happens in between those uh workout days so yeah and, and what, what i found personally is that by being in the gym only four days a week as opposed to maybe six People would say that, well, if you're in the gym more often, then you have shorter sessions, but it's not really the session length for me that's the concern. It's more so all the other stuff that goes into going to the gym, you know, the preparation, travel time, warming up, post-workout and everything. It's not really, even if your session is an hour, the entire thing is more like two and a half hours, at least for me. So, um, Yeah, I mean, splitting up a one-hour workout uh, over two days is not going to be like two times 30 minutes. It's yeah. going to be two times like 45 or 50 minutes because, like you said, all the other stuff, warming up and getting ready and preparing and, you know, it's, it's, uh, it all takes time and out of your day. Yeah. Um, and, and, and perhaps, and, and this is also something that in the previous um, Q&A we had, someone asked you what brought you to your higher training frequency recommendations initially and your current recommendation, which is uh, two to three sets, two to three times per week. Um, what, what is the point where you like to cap out training frequency per, per muscle group um, these days? Well, for me, the, the, those are the recommendations I follow myself. So I, I'm in the gym like every two to three days now. Right. Yeah. So I, I, I do prefer that at the time uh, mm -hmm. or, or for the time being. Um, but, but yeah, I, I used to do like one set every day and... Um, while that did work, you sometimes fool yourself into thinking you have great progress simply because, well, you, you're kind of moving your body every day and you, you allow yourself to eat more calories every day and, and all that stuff. But uh, I think progress overall, especially when you want to have a life outside of the gym, is, is uh, in my opinion, current opinion, it, it's better when you just have those workout days and, and you can just be a family guy and, and social guy and, and, and business guy on the other days. 
yeah no i agree i agree i'm glad to hear it because i really don't like my current gym so um okay so um there was a question on the two week reset or the rest period. So um, in your my reps ebook, you also recommended, and even in that Facebook famous Facebook post of yours that I keep referring to, you recommended a ten to fourteen day rest period before you uh, go into a more minimalistic sort of training approach. So um, I guess a more general question: if someone is cu- currently killing him or herself in the gym with tons of volume and wants to try something more lower volume, more minimalistic. Uh, would you say that doing a kind of reset phase when they are just resting is is a requirement before? Yes. And that's, why, why you know that? that just yes, of course. <laughs> if you if you've been half asking it for a while and just trying out different stuff and, and doing the fuck around like this uh, kind of thing, then sure, just jump straight in. But uh, you know that if you've been um, if you've been applying heavy loads to the tissue, that, that tissue or the muscle is, is, uh, has started the adaptation process of building up resistance to that load. And, and so switching into my reps and lighter loads will be less efficient without the reset before, but it will be efficient from the standpoint of introducing a novel stimulus, uh, uh, like a metabolic stimulus. Uh, and, and, and that contrast from the heavy loading will definitely keep the, the muscle growth process going and, and even reignite it uh, as I've written uh, an article on but uh, in my opinion I, I think it would serve you well if you've been training for eight to ten weeks or more to have uh, that that reset period uh, not only from a physiological standpoint but also from the mental side of things be motivated when you start this this type of program that's going to help you gain more yeah, I, that's what I wanted to say that even from, a, if anything, from a psychological perspective, I think that when you've been doing tons of volume in the gym, then oftentimes going there and doing something lower volume can almost feel like you're just wasting your time. And and it, it can be hard to be motivated, even if you accept that, okay, I'm doing this to make better gains in the future or make this training setup more sustainable. It In the moment, it can feel like, well, like I'm not going to grow, like I've been doing way more and I'm like, now I'm working less hard and it can be hard to gather the motivation. But if you take a rest week even beforehand, then you can appreciate mentally again, those lower workloads or work volumes. So, um, exactly. and, and also keep in mind that no matter what you've been doing before, it's not as if the muscle is suddenly like, just because you, you applied yourself in the gym and, and train hard and train heavy. It's not as if the, the muscle growth process is impossible to, to, uh, to initiate. Uh, but but um, and this is also the problem with uh, with uh, you want increasingly higher volume and frequency. This this is what the body will um, respond to and adapt to, and and eventually you're going to need more frequency and volume to keep adapting. So by inserting that period of rest, we have seen some solid evidence that this does indeed reset the tissue sensitivity. Not like it, you're going to get newbie gains at all, but it does <clears throat> like lower the threshold for both load and volume to a point where even one set is going to have an effect. And that one set is not going to have an effect if you've been doing 10 sets before. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and this is a, then a good segue into another question, which was about what, what is your, what do you think about the kind of traditional deloading models that are commonly used, which is you pretty much do the same thing in the gym, but just take out a set or two on each movement and maybe do one or two reps less, but keep the load on the bar as opposed to just taking a complete rest phase. What do you, what do you think about those? I think it's a waste of time since you've been adapting to a certain volume and frequency and, and just lowering that to a, to a minimal, uh, like cutting it in half or whatever, uh, arbitrary uh, recommendation is, is going to set you back. You're not going to gain and you're not going to reset anything. Um, I would use it for for a peaking for a contest, though. It, it works great for that simply because uh, as you um, you know accumulate volume and, frequ- uh, and frequency or, or loading, um, you also accumulate fatigue and, and uh, making sure that fatigue has dissipated completely and allow you to express that strength potential. Uh, Necessitate some type of taper or uh, or or deload, uh, but I, I use a deload when I see like a reactive deload when I get to the gym and I see that uh, I have regressed, and the reason I do that is simply because the display of strength is usually a function of muscle damage, 
And uh, obviously there are neural factors involved as well, but we can see that neural recovery happens on the order of a few hours, maybe 24 hours at the most, but muscle damage can take a longer time to repair and, and uh, the damage itself creates inflammation and creates signaling that inhibits uh, the display of strength. So th this is why strength is a good proxy for whatever is going on inside the muscle. And if, if again, you, you're regressing, um, then it, it serves you well to stop at the first sign of regression and, and don't continue that workout and accumulate more muscle damage. But because the muscle is not going to grow until that muscle damage is, is repaired. And so just stopping that exercise and, and uh, all work for that muscle group and, and maybe adding another rest day uh, until we hit it again is, is going to ensure that you're actually getting some muscle growth out of it. But other than that, I prefer just resetting everything and, and going back to lighter loads and, and uh, progress from there. Right. And um, in terms of maybe just get some um, some idea for people about the reactive deloads, like, um, of course, I, I know what you're talking about because um, I've, I've, I've done some, uh, my education is coming from a similar, similar background as, as, as yours, I guess, but um what, well i was uh, part of developing that education so, so yeah yeah, yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah that, that's what i was alluding to yeah yeah um so um how how do you determine which kind of kinds of movements uh, you are implementing that reactive deload on so or or what what are sort of the signs that you're looking for like you're not able to hit a set a pr on a given lift and then you abort subsequent sets or how do you like to do it well not pr but but let, let's say that you get 10 reps uh, of 100 kilos and you in increment the load by two and a half kilos on your next workout. And that's, you know, you, you should be able to get 10 reps uh, if you have been gaining in strength. If you get nine, nine reps, you're, you're basically just maintaining since like one rep is equal to two and to two and a half percent uh, in, in loading. Uh, but if you can barely get nine, then you have regressed. And that's a clear sign that you should just stop there. Don't do any, uh, in any further sets. So, so you basically just look at performance from the last time and monitor. Obviously, if you're training with reps in reserve, it's going to be harder. But uh, generally, you, you might feel that the muscle is uh, tight and, and something doesn't feel right. And, and um, uh, maybe the, the warm-ups are, are moving slow and the first few reps are moving slow. Something just feels off. And, and even, I, I, um, as, as you probably know, I, I used to test uh, grip strength before going to the gym. So since grip mm -hmm. strength is, is a very good uh, proxy for CNS readiness, um, if you have a baseline grip strength and, and it uh, dramatically drops from one workout to the next, then you might just not go to the gym at all. And, and some people have noticed this when they uh, will, uh, you know, grab a 20 kilo plate and hold it like, like this. Mm -hmm. and carry it across to the Olympic bar. And, and some days it's, it, it starts slipping out of your hand. It's just yeah. like you don't have any grip strength at all. Whereas other days, you know, it feels like an iron fist. And, yeah. and uh, having them slip out of your hands like that is a clear sign that, okay, since your grip strength is, is now compromised and your uh, overall recovery is probably also compromised. Awesome. Perfect. I think we knocked this... Um deloading rest question out of the park pretty well or you did i should say um another good one is um is is there do you think there's a benefit of lifting heavy if someone is only interested in hypertrophy and not in gaining strength so i guess this means like you know lower lap, lower reps higher load um what do you think uh, I think if, if you're not concerned about strength at all, you can get away with just bodyweight training and higher reps and my reps. Uh, I was actually asked this question uh, just a couple of days ago. Um, and for, for muscle growth, uh, I tend to agree with what Jeremy Melanica said that, well, around 70, maybe 80% of one RM uh, is, is uh, like the maximum load that you actually need to lift for, for hypertrophy. And even lower than that can be used if you just maximize the, the metabolic pathway. But, you know, being a, like an ex-powerlifter, I, I do, and also being very fast twitch dominant, I do see there being some benefits to doing three to five rep work simply due to neural uh, enhancement and, and enabling you to lift heavier loads in the lighter or higher rep ranges as well. And there are some, some um, 
you know, there, there are some, some very significant benefits from doing heavy loading without the metabolic component, as I talked about last time. So um, I, I do think you can get by without heavy loading and, and low reps, but uh, if you want to maximize muscle growth, then then I do think it, uh, it has its place in, in the program. Yeah, yeah. awesome. If, if that even answered the question, but but yeah, yes, you no. can do without it if strength is not a priority. But I think it does add a little extra. Yeah, and no, I I mean that was literally the question, and um, I guess uh, the, the since you mentioned mentioned strength. Um, how much do you think, uh, and I don't know if you, you've listened to the interview that I just did with Jeremy Lenecke, but um, how much do you think that strength gains on a weekly basis are a good gauge for, for a hypertrophy? Well, as long as you're you know, applying protocols that, uh, that are designed to, to make the muscle grow, then strength will increase alongside with it. So I don't think it's a worthless proxy. I, I think it's the best proxy you have for, like I just mentioned on the, on the previous question here, that uh, that you haven't damaged the muscle, but you have stimulated it to grow. So if if strength uh, is like stagnant or regressing, then that's an indication that your hypertrophy protocol has been over applied, or your recovery isn't uh, what it needs to be to to make that protocol work. So. Uh, Although I do agree that there's not, not a direct correlation, uh, I, I don't think you can say it's zero correlation. I think the correlation is strong enough to, to make uh, actual strength gains uh, be an indicator that what you're doing now uh, with your programming is, is, uh, is moving in the right direction. Yeah, yeah, awesome. And, and what, what, what sort of, um, for the average intermediate lifter, um, what sort of percentage increases in strength or or reps are you are you looking for in general from workout to workout wow this this varies so much it's uh it's a really hard question to answer but i think during the most productive part of your cycle you should be seeing at least two like one to two percent strength gains every week mm -hmm. uh even up to five percent and, and when i program my cycles and i split it up into a and b full body workouts I increment the loads like five percent for each exercise, uh, but but that's you know concurrently dropping uh, rep ranges. So yeah. so within those parameters, I'm I'm looking at uh, yeah probably uh, around the one to two percent strength gains. Or like in my in my uh, case, since I'm like very advanced, it's it's probably on like every other to every third week. But look looking at the data available, I I do see at least two percent every week being a very realistic uh, gain and, and over eight to 10 weeks, I have seen gains of 20 to 30% in, in uh, strength gains. Mm. So that's, you know, obviously from uh, clients that start working with me and without me knowing uh, too much about what they have been doing before. Sure, sure, sure. sure. Um, now the next question is, uh, is, is a pretty cool one. It kind of ties into the concept of cluster sets somewhat. somewhat. So, um, and in a general sense, what do you think is the role of uh, rest periods between sets? Well, I guess it's a two-parter then. So first of all, let's, let's just start there. Uh, do you think that rest periods per se have an important role or um, can you get the same benefits by doing shorter rest periods and, um, and um, yeah, or, or letting it auto-regulate and just resting as long as you need, as long as kind of the total work volume is the same? Okay, think? so there's... There's two angles here. One is during volume equated conditions, shorter rest periods are, are pretty much the same uh, in terms of efficiency. Um, but, but there are a few caveats here. And, and uh, one is that, you know, if you tell people do five sets of max reps, the long rest condition is you, it's uh, obviously going to get more total volume because they're fresher for every set. And so most research and also the meta reviews uh, show that longer rest periods are more effective. And, and I do tend to agree with that, especially when it comes to heavier loads. Uh, and that's simply because you don't want the metabolic pathway to interfere too much with a mechanical pathway. So you want those heavier loads to actually do the work they're supposed to. But when you move into the lighter load spectrum and, and higher ups, uh, I think rest periods should definitely be manipulated to make sure that 
you are balancing f the fatigue failure point so that you're staying at a high level of muscle recruitment. Uh, because if you take long rest periods, you actually need to work back up to that point, that fatigue point, to, to make uh, all muscle fibers contribute. And, and so that's, that's the entire basis uh, behind my reps. You, you simply do that one activation set and then manipulate rest periods to make sure you maximize metabolic stress and, and maximize the effective reps, which is a coin that I termed. And I now see more and more authorities uh, actually copying. Yeah. And and then and what what would you think of sort of a combining sort of the myo rep sort of um, outline on training with the with the heavier loads? So for example, let's say you're doing sets of like four to six, so pretty heavy weights, and instead of resting longer and doing those sets of four to six, uh, resting for shorter periods of time, and then if you can't if you're not able to hit your whatever, let's say six reps then you're stopping the set midway through, rest a little bit, and then in a kind of cluster set sort of fashion, you still crank out the remaining reps that are missing. In that case, I would actually consciously stop at one or two reps and, and do short rest periods and, and make it a cluster rep combination uh, from the get-go, simply because at that point, at that loading range, you already have maximal fiber recruitment and you don't need to do the activation sets. If, if you go to failure on the first set, you're going to limit your, the total volume you can do, and you're also going to generate uh, probably too much uh, uh, fatigue to, to be able to recover from, uh, to, from one, one workout to the next. And this is exactly some people's experience. So use my reps on higher reps and, and use cluster sets and, and longer rest periods. Make sure that the rest periods are long enough to, to actually make you perform better. You can actually feel this when you do the first a rep on the next cluster set that you have rested long enough because it, it's, it's going to almost fly up and you're going to feel stronger from a neural potentiation. So, so at that point, you actually want to, to minimize metabolic fatigue and, and work on the more me mechanical neural components. So, so this is why the, the program is going to outline this. Uh, you can either gradually switch from one to the other by applying various like cluster set combinations as you transition into it to the every loading, but I might actually prefer just switching from one to the other from, you know, abruptly as you switch, sort of switching gears. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Uh, I think that cleared it up pretty nicely. And um, next question is, um, and we actually just had a pretty cool discussion over this in the Facebook group, which is um, how would you adjust volume and frequency during cutting as opposed to bulking uh, phases? Yeah, so my general recommendation is simply because you have less available energy for recovery uh, to, to uh, reduce volume and, and frequency. Uh, this, this is going to uh, depend on training level uh, because beginners can just gain muscle almost no matter what they do. And if you have a lot of body fat, you also have more available energy for mobilizing. So, so the available energy is the sum of incoming calories and uh, stored calories you're going to have to always take that into account. And so an abuse beginner is going to be able to cut calories really hard and just go hard at the gym, uh, obviously according to their uh, training level. You don't really need to train all that much at that level since the threshold is so low. Uh, and they're just going to, the fat is just going to melt off them and, and they're, they're going to be gaining muscle at the same rate as if they were like at bulking calories. But the more advanced you get, the more careful you need to be about applying the stress and uh, having sufficient recovery and having sufficient energy for recovery. And, and uh, the harder you, you, you cut your calories and the less available energy you have, I think at some point you're just going to realize that, that gaining muscle during that deficit is going to be impossible. You know, it's going to be hard to gain muscle in the surplus. So, so think maintenance instead of gaining. And, and uh, enjoy the added recovery you get because uh, it's going to help you suffer through the you know getting it to uh, single digit body fat levels yeah and and um what is your take on uh, there's sort of a, a divide in in how people think about this that some people like to focus on maintaining volume uh, doing maybe higher rep work and just focusing on getting total kind of tonnage of work uh, through your training and some other people like to reduce the volume and keep it heavy 
So keep keep high loads, uh, and that should be that should do it to keep muscle mass. Uh, how do you like to think about it? I, I approach it the same way I do during gating phases. So it's a progressive uh, load loading increments and and, uh, and optimized volume, which is again going to be lower than than usual. Uh, but but you need to keep the stimulus going if you want to maintain muscle mass. Having said that, we have studies showing that like a sixty to seventy percent reduction in training volumes uh, and even just one to two sets one times per week can uh, maintain muscle mass pretty nicely in, in uh, a lot of people but again the more advanced you get the, the and the leaner you want to get the higher risk you have of losing muscle i have experienced this firsthand and uh keeping the stimulus going keeping things as optimal as possible uh, i think is more or less a necessity so awesome. but, but you know there's there's no like there's no preference for heavier heavier loads or, or lighter loads you, you're gonna need to progress from one to the other in my opinion you can't just stay at the same like of course you can do the slow and tedious increase reps at the same load increase loads increase reps etc etc but i think that's just stretching things out endlessly and i prefer to just go from one to the other simply to stay ahead of the adaptation curve awesome um, and uh, the last question that I have uh, written down for myself here. So, guys, if you're watching this and you want to get um, some questions in, if you have some good one, maybe we can make time for that at the end as well. But uh, what is your take on, I guess I'll simplify this question, but what is your take on volume thresholds and that there is like a range of volumes that can be beneficial for someone and like the minimal effective volume and then uh, maximal recoverable volume and uh, that you should kind of work through these these ranges um, wh what is your thought on that one uh, well my thought is um, looking at non-responders in studies it's, it's very difficult to say whether they need more or less volume um, there are some studies looking at endurance adaptations where adding more volume uh, helps, like makes responders out of non-responders. So, so that could very well also be the case with, uh, with the muscle growth. Um, <clears throat> and it doesn't hurt to try it, but um, I'm more in interested in looking at, like we, we know that the, the limitations in non-responders is usually the satellite cell process and the donation of myonuclei and uh, the ribosomal biogenesis, like uh, how efficiently the, the mitochondria and the myonuclei and, and, and the ribosomes are working. So, so just the more building blocks and the more room you have for growth and, and, and the more workers you have to build with is, is probably the most limiting factor. And, and, and I'm not sure that just adding volume is, is going to resolve that. But, but yes, I do think that some people have higher work tolerance and, and probably need more volume. But with, with the success I've had uh, with, with quite like moderate volumes uh, in, in all kinds of trainees, even the typical hard gainers, and, and sometimes especially the hard gainers, uh, I think it's more a function of people's lifestyle interfering with recovery to a degree that makes even one set too brutal for them. And, and so my approach has been the holistic one where we look at, you know, sleep scheduling, nutrition, circadian rhythms, just getting their overall inflammation levels down because we know that's huge in, in, in limiting muscle growth and, and fat loss and, and hormone optimization and, and all that stuff. Just making sure the whole system is online and, and having all your ducks in a row. And when, when all that is in place, we can start discussing volume. But, but at that point, the, the discussion is usually irrelevant because they have just, you know, started gaining again. So, so it's not about just adding volume arbitrarily, but, but actually looking at the individual and, and identifying whatever bottlenecks is, is going on here. And, and usually it's, it's a lifestyle thing. Very, very often it's a lifestyle thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and I'm still, I'm still just wondering, um, I mean, you obviously talked about this in the previous Q&A, but I'm still wondering what are some of the factors that explain this discrepancy between what some of the research shows and what real life shows in terms of these volume amounts, like, because the 10 to 20 sets, like that was one thing, and like even 20 sets was crushing a lot of people, but now I see these 30, 45 set protocols, and that's just, I mean, I... 
I don't know, like out of the thousand friends that I have on Facebook, which is way more friends than I have in real life. <laughs> but out of those, um, not many of them are very big and muscular individuals. And out, of, uh, and out of those that are big and muscular, I would say just as many do lower volumes as higher volumes. So I'm still curious, like what are the things that describe this discrepancy? But I guess this will be a... In studies, it, it can maybe not easily be explained, but you need to keep in mind that there's a huge variation. I just posted this on, on Facebook the other day that, you know, gains are from zero to 250% in, in a single study. Uh, and so, again, just teasing out the, the statistical um, average best result from one volume to the other is, is, you know, it doesn't tell the full story. And, and also when, uh, when doing studies, you, you usually recruit like college athletes. You recruit well-trained guys that have, you know, their hormones and everything is, is more optimal for gaining and, and highly motivated people. And, and uh, you know, there's so many, so many factors involved in the subject pool that can explain why they respond better to, to higher volumes. And, and you're also not, sorry, I'm just going to move out of the way of the sun. Um, you also don't know whether these results can actually continue beyond the 8 to, eight to 12 week point. And uh, more often than not, they don't, you know, uh, like I mentioned last time, uh, as for trainability, we have seen the high responders, they don't, you know, stay high responders for the rest of their lives. Uh, sometimes the high responders tend to stagnate and hit a wall and, and start to regress and, you know, just it takes them several months to get back to where they were simply because they were gaining so fast in the first place. So th there's just so many things going on there that just just looking at numbers from a study and concluding and anything from that, that's not the same as the sustainable approach that, that you and I are uh, talking about. Because we want to keep people gaining for uh, like the next three to five years and, and, and hopefully more, not just an eight to 12 week study where we just hammer people and, you know, don't control for any variables other than uh, their training logs. You know, we don't know if they're training to failure or not. And, you know, there, there's just a lot of missing data. So um, I, I think science can, can point us in the right direction, but when actually working with, with people in the real world, this is when uh, these things kind of need to be nuanced. And, and that's why I've arrived at my conclusions. Uh, that, that's one side of it. And the other is when you apply the, the progression guidelines that, that I have developed and, and obviously based on on uh, like 20 year old programs uh, that I was part of, uh, you know, the hypertrophy specific training group that I participated in for, for you know, many, many years and, and, and Brian Haycock and all his interesting work and, and recent dissertation. And, and there's so many missing parts of the puzzle that when you apply these pieces, then the rest makes more sense. And, and um, we can make that volume work for us to a much higher degree and then just randomly applying volume without any uh, sort of um, uh, preference or, or um, consideration to what that trainee or lifter has been doing before. So when all, all the pieces fit and are applied uh, in, in a structured and strategic manner, then this type of volume that I'm talking about and this frequency and this progression guideline is going to have the maximum benefits. And I, 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 um, I can almost guarantee it is, it's going to work much better than just randomly picking some program off the net and, and trying to make it work for you. Perfect. Um, yeah, so I think we can wrap it up in just uh, in a couple of minutes. Uh, just one, one really good question that I've somehow overlooked in, in our questions here is what are some overlooked exercises in your opinion? Um, well, overlooked exercises, I would say, I, I, I think I alluded to it in, uh, in the Facebook, uh, Facebook uh, discussion today. Uh, but I do think unilateral, like one, not one leg per se, but unilateral uh, leg exercises are uh, in many ways better than bilateral. So for all the people doing squats and deadlifts, I'm, I'm sure you're going to hate my face right now. But, uh, you know, I, I tend to prefer split squat variations and one, le one leg RDLs and, and all the way to doing uh, leg extensions and leg curls one leg at a time. Uh, the only exercise that's going to be hard to do is obviously glute ham raises. Uh, but um, 
you know, we, we, we are created uh, asymmetrical and, and we have a, a, a asymmetrical, um, you know, we, we, we do have certain imbalances uh, simply because we always move around this way. We climb, we walk, we, we run one leg at a time and, and uh, working the muscles that way, uh, in my opinion, makes, and, and my experience, uh, has made several aches and pains go away uh, and uh, just, just tends to improve much more over a training cycle than the bilateral work that I've been struggling with for, for my whole training career. Um, for upper body, I think you can get away with and, and benefit more from bilateral work, but um, I also tend to think that just doing chins and push-ups are underrated. Um, um, f the face pull and shoulder pull is way underrated compared to doing rows, in my opinion simply because it works uh, muscle groups that are, tend to be un underdeveloped. Um, but, but yeah, off the top of my head, those are the ones that I definitely think should be uh, staples of any uh, program. Yeah, I was just going to mention weighted push-ups, which uh, I think like when people think of push-ups... Push yeah, for sure, yeah. Push-ups yeah. is just my favorite exercise for, for chest. Nothing has added more growth uh, and strength to my pressing than, than push-ups. Yeah. And when I had my shoulder injury, which was bugging me for a really long time, and it made it really difficult for me to train my chest in any sort of effective way without causing shoulder pain, then that was a big saver for myself. So yeah, yeah me too. Man. Me too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, cool. So I think we pretty much well, not pretty much we actually went on for an hour. So I think we can pretty much wrap it up here. So um, yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, yeah, just mm, let's mention, I guess I'll mention it anyway when I'll upload this to YouTube, but head over to sustainableselfdevelopment.com and uh, you can opt in for this training uh, template that Berge mentioned a couple of times, which will be coming out hopefully in approximately a month and a half maybe. Um, and yeah, um, for those of you who are watching this on YouTube, just join the Sustainable Self Development Facebook group. So um i think that was it and uh, next week um if everything goes well then we will do another one on uh, nutrition at least that's the plan awesome well thank you for everybody for tuning in and uh, hopefully we will see each other soon thank you so much and see you guys all right guys hope you enjoyed this episode and once again if you haven't checked it out already be sure to visit the sustainable self-development facebook group at facebook.com slash sustainable self-development and if you haven't done it already visit sustainable self-development.com to be up to date with everything that we've got going on there all right thank you for hanging on up until now and see you in the next episode